Welcome everyone uh, to this uh, webinar, already the fourth one in our series on the COVID-19 response. Uh, my name is Ewald Vergeniken and I am moderating today. And today we have a very interesting subject because we are going to look in depth at the rollout in Israel, which has been lauded as a, as a, as a uh, success in, by many. And I think in our uh, webinar, we are going to look whether we can replicate some of the success factors or perhaps we cannot. Um, we will do this, um, we will also try to answer questions like what were the specific factors that were contributing to this early success, what was uh, the contribution of the existing infrastructure and the organizational and health workforce capacities, are there any lessons and concerns for the long term, and especially how might other countries use this experience when swiftly scaling up their uh, vaccination programs. Uh, we will do this with the following speakers. The first speaker, our keynote speaker, is my colleague Ruth Weisberg from Israel, who has joined the Berlin Hub of the European Observatory at the Berlin University of Technology. So she's working from Berlin, but she is also still involved with the health policy team at the Myers JDC Brookdale Institute in Israel. And she is a regular contributor to our health systems uh, response monitor to the COVID-19 pandemic for Israel and editing many other countries. So she will give us an overview of the Israeli response. Then we have two spotlight speakers from two very differing countries. We will start with Madelon Kohneman for the Netherlands. And Madelon is a senior researcher at Nivel in the Netherlands with a focus on international health system. And she also contributes to our HSRM uh, COVID-19 response monitor. And we will hear from her uh, about the Dutch response and how successful or not successful that has been so far in terms of the vaccine rollout. Then we will move to Billy Palmer, who is a senior fellow in health policy at the Nuffield Trust in the UK. His focus is on workforce, normally in his work, but not exclusively, because he has just recently published a paper on variation and vaccine rollout in the UK. So he seems to be the right person to talk to today. Then we have uh, my colleague John Silas from the London uh, hub of, the, of the, you know, the European Observatory, and he will reflect on these experiences and what European countries can or cannot learn uh, from these experiences. But now I would like to go over to uh, Matthias Wismar, who will not only monitor uh, the chat box today, so keep posting your questions whenever you have one, uh, but we'll, we will also introduce uh, a poll. So, Matthias. Ewald, well, thank you so much. Yes, we have prepared a little poll, actually two questions, you know, to strengthen a little bit the interactivity between you, the audience, and uh, the speakers. So we will have this poll as one element which we can play around a little bit in the discussion. Annalisa, please start the poll. So, um, two questions. The first one, would you get vaccinated? And they are in principle four um, answers. Yes, I already have been. Lucky you. Yes, please. Just waiting my turn. So uh, quite impatiently. Number three, maybe once we know more about the vaccine, so a little bit cautious. And number four, no, never. Only one choice is possible. The second question is, who should be prioritized to receive the vaccine first? And you know that countries have done already their strategies, but still, we would like to learn from you. The oldest, old, 85 plus, they are at the highest risk of death. Those aged 65, 60 to 75, they are using all the hospital beds. People with chronic conditions, age might increase risk, but it's really people in poor health who suffer most. And finally, frontline, no, 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 finally, frontline health and care workers, they have been putting themselves at risk for a year now. Give them, give it to them first. And finally, teachers, someone please get my kids back in school. And again, only one choice is possible. We will keep this open for a couple of minutes until you all have made your choices and I hand back to you, Evo, again. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matthias. And then uh, now uh, I think it's time to hear from Israel. So Ruth, the floor is yours. Thank you, Evo, and uh, I'm happy to be here presenting the Israeli uh, vaccine rollout. I'll share my screen because I have a presentation to show you. Um, and so I'm going to talk about the short-term short successes and we'll raise some questions for the long-term uh, because 
Israel is now where Europe and other countries will be in a couple of months. And I think that uh, learning from what has been happening in Israel can be useful for other countries. Um, and I will uh, talk about three main points. The first one is availability, then provision, and then compliance. These are three basic elements for the rollout in Israel. And why is it interesting to talk about Israel and see what happened there? Well, first of all, uh, it's because they have done an impressive job. Within less than two months since the vaccination campaign started, uh, Israel has already vaccinated um, more than 80% of its population uh, that is aged more than uh, 70 years old. And we can see here in the graph that uh, more than 50% of the population aged 40 and more has been vaccinated with both doses. And this is very impressive in absolute terms already. But if we look at uh, relative terms, uh, it's even more impressive. If uh, these, these data are from yesterday, and uh, we see here that Israel has vaccinated about 44% of its entire population, uh, at least with one dose. And the next in the queue is uh, the United Kingdom with 20% of the population. And they started vaccinating relatively at the same time. So it's, it's beautiful what they have been done in, uh, doing in Israel. And if we have a look at the uh, fully vaccinated population, uh, we see that in Israel we have 28% uh, of the population. And the next one is the US with almost 4%. So we have something to learn from what has uh, uh, been done in Israel. And the, before I start explaining, I would just to uh, tell about some key characteristics of the Israeli health system for those who are not so familiar. So Israel has a national health insurance uh, that covers all citizens and residents. Uh, they have four health plans. They are competing, non-profit, and national in scope. And the health plans are responsible for the provision of health care, not only the payment for the, the care. So they employ primary care nurses and physicians. They contract with specialists, and they also purchase hospital services. And uh, all that is done with in a very efficient way because Israel has lower than average resources, both in terms of funds and uh, workforce and uh, hospital beds per population. So uh, this is something that uh, has to be mentioned because it has some implications. So the first uh, element for the rapid rollout of the vaccine is the availability of the vaccine, right? Without vaccines, there's no story. And Israel had enough doses. So there are many uh, reasons for that. And one of that is that there was a collaboration agreement between Pfizer and Israel with the objective uh, to determine whether herd immunity is achieved after reaching a certain percentage of vaccination coverage. And uh, so within this agreement, Israel committed to provide anonymized aggregated data about the vaccinated population, the side effects and uh, the effectiveness of the vaccine. And, in, in, and Pfizer had to provide the, Israel with enough doses. Uh, and Israel was a good candidate for this because they had in place already some infrastructure for this whole uh, project. First of all, health plans have universal and coherent electronic medical records for all their members, and these can be unified and used to support research. And in fact, this has been done already for a couple of years. Uh, health plans have been provided medical records that are anonymized for research, so they didn't have to invent the wheel. Uh, and uh, there is also privacy and data protection laws that allow for more latitude, at least compared to the European Union laws, and they were less updated back in the 90s. So while this might be a disadvantage in normal times, when we are in an emergency, in a pandemic, and things have to move fast, it turned out to be an advantage for this uh, case. So um, this was uh, one of the reasons that Israel had the vaccines, but having the vaccines is not enough. The second uh, element was the provision of uh, the service. And Israel chose to decide, uh, sorry, Israel decided to rely on the health plan's primary care structure that is very strong instead of other um, systems like the underfunded 
public, uh, public health services. Um, and the health plans had a lot of uh, advantages. The first one is that they had experience and infrastructure uh, for planning and implementing prompt responses uh, to large scale national emergencies. Health plans have been involved in the planning and exercising this kind of national uh, uh, vaccination. So it did, they weren't caught by surprise. They had this, at least some planning and had the thought about how to implement this kind of national emergency vaccination campaign. Um, the second advantage is the uh, information technology infrastructure. So they, they, it, it's very easy to make appointments for any kind of services uh, with the health plan uh, structure. And it, this uh, infrastructure was used also for the vaccination appointments. So people can call the national call centers that they are very used to call when they have to make any kind of appointments. They could use the websites of the health plans to make the appointments and even the mobile phone apps. So this was an advantage uh, to um, having these appointments very accessible to the population. Um, also, because they have electronic medical records of the whole population that they uh, uh, cover, it was very easy for them to identify high risk individuals and call them to get vaccinated. So people would receive SMS emails calling them, hey, you are a priority group, come make your appointment with this link, come and get vaccinated. Um, another advantage is that uh, they have primary care clinics spread over the country, included in remote areas, and that had uh, very good access to population, even in uh, sparse, uh, sparse uh, or uh, not very central areas. Um, in Israel, the nurses are authorized to vaccinate people without physicians being present, and they take the lead of vaccinations in general, for example, uh, the flu vaccination. And in this case, nurses also led the whole campaign. The thing is that Israel has lower than average rate of nurses per population compared to the OECD. So what happened is that because health plans employ directly the nurses, they were able to uh, deploy them from their regular tax tasks to the vaccination campaign. And uh, so they are working uh, after hours, they are working a lot, they reduce their regular work in the primary work, primary care uh, services they provide in the community, and they dedicated most of their time to the vaccination campaign, and this was uh, an advantage. The question is uh, how sustainable that is on the long term, right? And the third element uh, that is important for a rapid uh, rest vaccination rollout is uh, the compliance of the population, because you can have all the vaccines and you, have, you can have the capacity to provide, but if people don't come and get the vaccines, it's not going to help. Uh, so there were a lot of efforts uh, to uh, in increase the compliance. So there were top-down initiatives and also bottom-up. Um, so the Ministry of Health and the Israeli Medical uh, Association uh, launched exhaustive campaigns to fight fake news, and they also launched awareness campaigns to publicize images of well-known people getting the jab. So, for example, celebrities, singers, but also leaders, political leaders, religious leaders, rabbis and imams and uh, uh, people that have influence over a great group of people would be uh, 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 vaccinated. The pictures and the, the, the were uh, advertised in the media and they would call their followers to come and get the jab as well. Uh, in addition, there were some bottom up and unplanned initiatives that were very nice because the health plans together with civic society groups would informally advertise uh, daily vaccination sites with the leftovers of the vaccines uh, and people that were non-priority groups like the young people could come and get these leftovers instead of, instead of uh, throwing them in the trash because uh, the, the uh, vaccinations cannot stand along, uh, too long uh, without the cooling system. So there was a sense of a race for the vaccine and uh, young people would come and take pictures and post on social media and it, it highlighted the popularity of the vaccine and it 
apparently increased demand and it reduced the existence among many groups. And think about the first people who got the vaccines back in December. Very few uh, information was available and uh, existence was quite high. So it required a lot of effort. But still, it's early to see whether the compliance will be sufficiently high. And that's mainly uh, among certain groups. Uh, for example, the low risk, the young population, we saw in the first slide that the rate of the vaccinated people that are under the age of uh, 40 is still low. It's true that they could get vaccinated just uh, three weeks ago, but still uh, a long way to go with these populations. And um, there are two main groups that uh, have more, uh, uh, they need more tailored reach out, which are cultural minorities, for example, ultra Orthodox Jews and Arabs. And there also have been a lot of efforts to get these groups come and get vaccinated. Uh, these these groups, some of them, um, they don't trust the government, they don't trust science, and they, the Ministry of Health and the uh, uh, public health organizations had to collaborate and reach out uh, their leaders, uh, religious leaders, and have them helping to convince people to come and get vaccinated. And there are some examples that are occurring right now that they are uh, making the vaccination sites some kind of fun. Uh, so they are making uh, events with music and distributing food so people come and apparently it's helping. So this is something that maybe other countries can learn because um, not only Israel has these uh, groups that trust less the government and have to have the tailored reach out uh, campaigns. Uh, so just to conclude, um, there were some selected factors that contributed to the early success of the vaccination rollout in Israel, but still they raised questions for the long term for all the countries, I believe. So the first one was the availability, the early procurement uh, of the vaccination with the Pfizer and the agreement that was possible mainly because of the good information technology infrastructure and the electronic medical records. And we raised the question of uh, what about loose privacy and data protection? Is this an advantage or a disadvantage? This is the question we have to ask ourselves. Uh, the next one is the provision. We saw that the nurses had a very big role in Israel and they were deployed from the other tasks and they're working after hours, but how sustainable that is. And we know that the vaccination campaign will, will last much longer than the emergency period that we are seeing now. And we have to think about how to integrate this new service to the all other services that are already provided in normal times. So this is something that countries will have to think about together. Um, and the third element is the compliance. Uh, in Israel, there were some facilitator uh, elements, which is the information technology for the appointments and a lot of campaigns to reduce existency. And we have to ask if this will be high enough among low risk people, especially minorities and harder to reach populations, for example, homebound older people. Um, so that's it. Thank you very much for the attention. And I'm back to you, Eva. Thank you very much, Ruth. Um, that was very enlightening. Uh, I'm not sure that there are already many questions coming in, but before we do questions, which we do at the very end, we're going to look at the poll results. So, Matthias, go ahead. Thank you so much, Evod. Yes, as you say, the, the chat box is getting full and we get a lot of material, and I'm looking forward to this uh, panel discussion. Annalisa, could you just display the poll results? Thank you so much. So, would you get vaccinated? And Fantastic, 20% out of our um, attendees have already been vaccinated and the overwhelming majority is actually waiting patientless <laughs> uh, without any patient for, for the vaccine. And there's 12% um, uh, who say maybe a little bit less, but very clearly people want to get vaccinated, very little hesitancy, and absolutely nobody says he doesn't or she doesn't want to be vaccinated. Now, with regards to the priority, they are a little bit more spread out. And interestingly enough, we also have this in the chat box, frontline health and care workers, 35% of respondents said uh, they should get actually priority because, and I've got it in the chat box, those are those which may actually get the um, infection the first and then spreading it actually in healthcare settings. But also, of course, the elderly with 33%, um, uh, the 85 plus should also be a priority. 
And the teachers, I'm very sorry to tell, but they have to join the queue at the very end, actually. So that's it. And I think we can pick up some of this later on in the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matthias. Indeed, very interesting results that we will get back to later on. Um, now we're moving to the Netherlands. Um, the Netherlands has a strong primary care infrastructure. They're well organized, so they must be doing great, aren't they, Madelon? Well, I made you a picture of uh, where the Netherlands is, and you see we are uh, doing uh, almost great. Uh, we are among the lowest of the uh, uh, countries in, uh, in Europe. Uh, and I will tell you a little bit about how it is, uh, has evolved this way. Before the start of the campaign, uh, the Netherlands is uh, characterized by a very decentralized kind of organization, especially uh, for public health. There are a lot of uh, different organizations involved and all these organizations are independent, so they're not government led. And uh, well, it takes time to get them all uh, involved and doing the right things. Um, the Minister of Health also wanted to, to start only vaccinating when everything was ready and prepared. He said he better wait a few weeks and then start uh, vaccinating when nothing uh, goes wrong anymore. Uh, it is, of course, the question of whether that, that this is uh, a good idea. Furthermore, there was a lack of preparedness. Uh, uh, there was only one strategy foreseen uh, and no alternatives. And the strategy that was foreseen was the, the way uh, the influenza uh, 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 vaccination distribution system uh, is working. But this uh, didn't, uh, in the long run, didn't, didn't work because it didn't match with the uh, uh, low storage temperatures that were required for the vaccine. So there was an acute problem at that moment, and there was nothing else prepared. And then we come to the priority setting, uh, and the Minister of Health asked advice to the National uh, House Council, uh, and they advised to uh, uh, start with nursing home residents and the oldest elderly first. Uh, but then there was the the problem of how to uh, distribute uh, the vaccinations. And then the, the lobbying started. Uh, first, the hospital personnel, and they said, well, we can start from day one with uh, vaccinating because we have a system in place and we can register everything and uh, we should start. And the government said, okay, good idea, we do so. And then the nursing home personnel said, okay, then we also can go first because it's difficult to get the vaccines to the nursing, nursing homes and we can travel so we can go to central places. So also they get the priority and then the GP said, no, we have to uh, take care of a lot of vulnerable people. We also have to, uh, have to be uh, in the front line. So we need a priority and also they get now priority. But also within the high risk group, uh, priorities keep changing. Uh, up to the point that there is a complete confusion now in the Dutch population about who is to be vaccinated when and is what which vaccine. Then there are some additional issues that are uh, not working right against us. The first, uh, there were the shortages of, uh, uh, of the vaccine. Uh, and to overcome this, uh, and, uh, and the policy to keep a second dose in storage is loosened. Uh, to increase the, at least the people who have the first vaccination. And the timing between the first and the second dose uh, has been stretched. And the uh, vaccination is no longer restricted to the person who is medically responsible. I have to explain this a bit. In the Netherlands, people in nursing homes uh, can fall under the medical responsibility of a, a, a physician, uh, of a nursing home physician or of the GP. And uh, this led to the situation that there uh, had to be two rounds of uh, vaccinations in, uh, in nursing homes, one round um, by the uh, uh, nursing home physician and one round by the GP, which is, of course, not very practical. And nowadays, it's allowed that uh, a medical, uh, that the nursing home physician does all the vaccination in a nursing home. Then we have different interp interpretation of uh, the protocols. Uh, some keep uh, fairly strict to protocols. Uh, for instance, there was a story of a, a nursing home that had uh, uh, a few uh, vaccines left over, and there were uh, informal carers who would like to have this vaccine, but they didn't get it. 
because it was not their turn and the vaccines were discarded. Whereas all of them print and print widely and they vaccinate all uh, personnel of the nursing home, for instance, also those that are not in direct contact uh, with patients. Then there are major uh, ICT issues. There are uh, data linkages discovered at the public health uh, uh, service uh, organizations. Uh, social security uh, numbers uh, uh, are at risk and uh, people are arrested uh, for this. And uh, the problem still hasn't been solved. And then we had uh, some weather. There was a little bit of snow in the Netherlands last week and that uh, uh, resulted in a, a stop of a complete stop of the vaccination campaign because it was too difficult to, uh, to reach uh, uh, the places where the vaccinations were going on. And uh, now there are also a lot of other uh, things that are more than keto, but I will stop here. I think the picture is quite clear uh, that the Netherlands is uh, quite uh, messy in uh, working on its uh, vaccination rollout. Thank you, and uh, I'd like to go back to Eva. Thank you very much, uh, Madelon. Messy indeed, as you say. Let's move to the UK and see what they are doing and whether everything is going fine there, as the numbers seem to suggest the front runner in Europe. Billy, go ahead. So hopefully you can see uh, uh, the front page of the slideshow. So yes, no, the context is the UK uh, in a uh, rare occasion in the pandemic is actually doing pretty well on the vaccine rollout uh, so far. So I'm gonna try to unpick a little bit about why that might be the case. Um, and in doing so, it's really worth thinking through, and I've seen some of the comments in the, the chat about the different stages of the uh, sort of life cycle of uh, the rollout. You know, you've got issues around developing a vaccine, then you go through to the procurement, the actual manufacturing them, the delivering them to the, to the country and then within the country. Uh, somewhere within that process, there's an approval, the regulatory approval to actually administer the, uh, the vaccine and then actually the administering. So it's worth sort of bearing those in mind. At the moment, uh, our success comes uh, on the basis of uh, good performance on the early stages of those. Um, I think we're sort of some indications we're doing, uh, we've got some favorable conditions for administering it, but there's certainly some lessons that can be learned there. And I think all countries can learn lessons, particularly from Israel, which who are that step further forward um, on administering their vaccine to the population. So um, I say one of the early issues is uh, supply and what I put up here is a uh, is an extract from uh, our national order office so that's the government spending watchdog who and it, for obvious reasons they can't publish the uh, the exact details of contracts but have given us enough to know why we might have had an, a uh, an advantage when it comes to the supply of vaccines so I sort of underline that first bit in one of the contracts uh, we have priority access uh, to a specific number of doses and thereafter it becomes a bit of a competition between countries and in another contract we have priority access to doses manufactured within the UK which is a massive advantage uh, because uh, we had uh, set up quite early on some manufacturing uh, capacity uh, for certain vaccines um, and on that manufacturing front we're also aided by uh, quite early on they uh, set up an arrangement with a generic drug maker uh, to fill vials and packages. So we were sort of, we're ahead in terms of that, the logistics of actually uh, getting that uh, drug out to, to people. Um, on the regulatory approval, uh, quite a lot has been said on that. We have, you know, we use a temporary authorization um, uh, around the vaccine that it meets safety and efficacy standards, um, but it's, it does mean we've accepted some more liability than say the EU have. So if there was a safety issue, it would fall more on the UK government uh, than it seems that some of the other countries have accepted liability wise. So there, is a, there was a reasonable risk on that. And for that reason, we were able to approve them uh, slightly earlier. I think we we're around the same time for one of the three that we've approved and actually ahead on the other two, uh, other two vaccines. Um, but just in the sort of supply side, and I'll just give you, uh, I should have put this up earlier actually. So just to contrast uh, the uh, conditions of our supply to that of the EU. So this is an extract uh, that the EU published of their contract with AstraZeneca. 
and the notable thing here is best reasonable effort. Now, if I wanted a contract, I think I'd rather have priority access uh, rather than something termed around best reasonable effort. And I think the reason why we've done well here is that we correctly, we correctly characterize the vaccine procurement issue as something similar to a private equity issue. And we have a lot of private equity experts, and indeed we have a lot of private equity experts who are close to the center of government. So they actually, for once, they draw on the right expertise. Um, we shouldn't be too smug about that. We clearly didn't correctly characterize some issues around uh, PPE, so the sort of protective gear for, um, for frontline staff, and uh, likewise when it comes to tests and trace. But on this occasion, we seem to do it right. So that's why we sort of got ahead on the supply side. In terms of then getting on to administering it, um, the Joint Committee on Vaccination and Immunization, so sort of it's like independent group, have uh, suggested the priority with which we administer those uh, vaccines. Um, it's primarily age-based. There's maybe a nod to the emerging evidence on the effect of the vaccine on transmission, so that it seems to actually stop levels of transmission. That's why you might see uh, healthcare staff in there and social care staff in there, um, but also suggestion of some sort of social justice. And it seems like the population are quite comfortable with that. You know, you give people a vaccine early because they've uh, suffered more uh, during the pandemic, you know, whether that's in, in work terms. We also gave priority to a first dose, so it raised some eyebrows, the fact that we would try to uh, sort of push the, uh, the length of time between first and second doses to get more people to have one dose than others. I think uh, Denmark was the only country that initially followed that lead, but I think others are considering it now. Um, and then, so that's sort of deciding on who gets it and then how you do it. Um, this is a messy uh, uh, map, but it just shows the different vaccination sites that we had available. Uh, there were 1,550 locations uh, as of 5th of February. So this is a, uh, so there'll be slightly more since then. Um, that includes uh, hospital hubs. Uh, if you've got very good eyesight, you'll see those in blue. Uh, mass centres in orange, uh, pharmacies in yellow. Uh, and local GP-led centres. So really a huge array of different places you could be getting your vaccine. Um, and just conscious of time, I'll quickly rattle through. The final question that we have to raise on this, because we're doing so doing pretty well in terms of uh, the percentage of people getting vaccinated, the question is, are we doing so in a fair way? And there's some real issues in terms of regionally, some of which can be explained by age profile, but certainly not all of it. You can see on this graph where uh, London uh, have you know, pretty high levels of COVID cases and yet doing pretty poorly on vaccination levels compared to others. And maybe some counterintuitive uh, signals coming out because we're vaccinating by age, you also see that deprived areas are lower down in terms of vaccination rates because actually um, those deprived areas tend to have a younger population. Um, and just finally on vaccine hesitancy, there's some quite worrying um, problematic issues around hesitancy within social care staff and actually within hospital staff as well. Um, so that's something we need, we need to think about. Thank you. Thank you very much, Billy. It seems that there are important lessons, especially in the future when there is more vaccine available. Um, John, can I ask you to, uh, to comment and reflect on what we just heard? So yeah, so I'm gonna give some brief reflections uh, <clears throat> on what the uh, Israeli rollout means for Europe and what Europe, if anything, can learn from the Israeli experience. And I think Ruth's uh, presentation was very interesting. It is obviously a very interesting case study, but I think unfortunately it does not offer a blueprint for most European countries going forward to try and replicate the success that Israel has had. Ruth was very clear uh, about a lot of the reasons for Israel's success, but I think that just too many of these factors are very Israel specific and not least among them is the fact that unlike most countries in Europe, uh, Israel was able to procure a huge amount of supply of vaccines very early, early on uh, by trading uh, with manufacturers, uh, trading their data with um, uh, patient data with manufacturers. Um, but there are other things as well. There's the good weather, of course, Madelon mentioned snow in the Netherlands, uh, which of course is gonna be a barrier to getting vaccines to people. Um, the structure of the health system, the, the integration <clears throat> between health plans and providers obviously made this much easier as well. Um, so I think that if anything, you know, maybe this reflects a lot of longer term uh, health system aspirations for some countries and sort of this idea that by 
by reducing fragmentation, um, by having closer relationships between purchasers and providers, not necessarily where purchasers employ providers, but at least where there is less of a separation that obviously when you need to act quickly, it's much easier to, uh, to mobilize um, when, when there's we're sort of direct lines of accountability. And of course, the, the access to well-developed uh, patient data, lots of countries in Europe have good patient data, but having, um, having this data not only enabled Israel to offer a trade to manufacturers to get a supply early on, but it made it very easy to get um, to, 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 to identify people who are eligible for the vaccine. So what, so what, what, what is the point? What can we learn from, from the Israel experience? So I would say at this very late stage, the thing to learn is really about the way that Israel set its prioritization groups. So Israel had a very simple and broad set of prioritization groups from the onset. These are, of course, govern, um, dictated by the fact that they had supply, but they focus on the, in the first instance, the 60 plus people with chronic conditions, uh, care home residents, and frontline health workers. And I think that this was a, a, a good approach because in being broad, uh, it, it, it made sure that they were able to target those people who are most at risk of death, which we know are people who are the oldest old people, um, 80, 80 and above, 85 and above, but also people that are at the highest risk of hospitalization. And if we look at this figure on the right, this is from England, <clears throat> and we can see, although I have uh, people's pictures covering it now, that there's a lot of, um, of ICU admissions among younger groups, among people 65 to 74, but also among people 45 to 64. Um, so targeting younger people <clears throat> does potentially relieve pressures on, on health systems. And the, the categories were also very simple. So people uh, knew they were eligible. It's easy to administer because there were clear links to delivery systems. The, the eligibility issue is perhaps more, of an, more of, a, of, a, of an issue in countries that require people to sign up for eligibility, rather, rather sign up for appointments rather than people who are contacted automatically. Now, if we look at the health system response monitor, we have only limited information so far, but there are a lot of countries that are not um, prioritizing based on age in this first round. So I have these list, some of these listed here. <clears throat> a lot of them are, are prioritizing health workers. You know, I saw in the chat box, some mentioned that, that you know, these people are potentially you know, passing on COVID to, to patients, of course, people who, who go to hospitals, people in care home settings. But of course, at this early stage, we didn't know very much about whether vaccination prevented transmission. And I think that that's still not fully uh, established. So, 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 you know, I, th I think it, it's interesting that so many countries, uh, even though they had very low levels of supply, they decided to prioritize uh, not based on age. And of course, as we heard from Madelon in the Netherlands, initially they had a similar approach to Israel, um, but due to lobbying, they, they changed and they focused on hospitals and nursing home personnel. Um, among those that do, uh, use age criteria at the onset. Uh, a number of them uh, start with very high uh, initial age criteria. So Austria, Germany, and the UK look at uh, 80 and over and then incrementally move downwards. And of course, in the UK, since they've been fairly quick, uh, they've been able to move down relatively rapidly. But of course, it raises questions about whether uh, there are diminishing returns of trying to reach every person who is above a certain age threshold, particularly if these people are more difficult to reach because they may not be, um, they might not have mobile phones, they may not uh, be as savvy with the internet. Um, so, so I think it, it raises some questions about whether whether a, a, a tiered approach like this is is actually the best uh, approach going forward. And so I think so for for short term lessons. You know, there's not much that, that countries can do at this stage um, to try and replicate Israel's experience. But I think that, that as supply comes in, which is starting to happen now, that countries uh, should take a, an approach where they look at, at broad vaccine criteria uh, that target both those people who are at highest risk of death, so the oldest old, but also those people who are at risk of hospitalization if we want to relieve pressures on health systems. Um, likewise, having very simple criteria, criteria that even I could remember uh, after Ruth's presentation, this is much more, uh, much easier to manage logistically, and also ensures in countries, I believe, um, Hungary and Greece, where people have to, have to, um, have to reach out to 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 make their own appointments. Uh, it helps when people know that they're eligible. But using this as an as a, a catalyst for longer term reforms, I think that this really highlights the benefits of, of reduced fragmentation, of more cohesion within within the health system. Um, more uh, uh, links, stronger linkages between purchasers and providers, and also the the, the benefits of, of well-developed patient data. So that's it, those are my short uh, comments. Thank you.
Thanks, John. That was uh, helpful for our discussion that we're having now. Uh, over to you, Matthias. Uh, lots of activity, I think, in the mailbox. Very specific questions, I think. Um, let's just dive right into it. And I'll ask all the, the speakers of today to come switch your screen on. You too, John. Billy, please. And then we uh, can start. Matthias. Thank you so much, Ewald. We have installed a larger screen, but I still need to scroll because we have so much input today. And I broadly categorize it into five, five um, categories of um, question. The first one, I think that's the crucial one, which partially John or John offered us an explanation to it. Is it just a supply side issue? You know, is it because Israel has approved the vaccine so early, has procured it so early, has procured it in large numbers? You know, is that the only reason and everything else is negligible? But I think you also gave with fragmentation some of the issues, some, some more leads, and in particular with comparison to the other countries, we can um, certainly follow them. Then there was an issue on the prioritization fairness. A couple of people like Tony, for example, came up with asking, you know, if using the leftovers, you know, for, for people that are not prioritized, was it kind of um, equity issue? You know, was it a lottery, you know? And also people might have been in the, uh, beginning a little bit anxious not becoming the vaccine and then they got it quickly so where they kind of um, calmed down by the quick rollout of the vaccine so that's a prioritization fairness issue and then there was um, I think it was on one of your slides actually Ruth and um, Neville wrote us a little message saying um, the the rollout was it really linear or were there like bumps you know that at certain points in time um, there was not so much vaccination, not necessarily because of the supply, but because of there were not enough patients um, willing to, to take the vaccine. And um, there was another very important um, issue um, on the um, evidence and on the experience Israel has made. Number one, with regards to side effects, adverse effects, you know, what have you actually seen there, you know, and how have you registered them? And on the other hand, how has Israel actually dealt with hesitancy and the other countries as, as, as well? So basically five questions and there's a special one for you, Ruth. We foresaw this. It comes from our friend, um, John Bovis, a friend of the house. He used to be a member of the European Parliament. He has asked, what about uh, the Palestinians? And I think you talked about the Arabs in um, Israel already, you know, but of course, everybody wants to know a little bit about Palestinians as well. And I think uh, it would be cool if you could fill us in. So Ebert and colleagues, back to you. Plenty of questions. Don't try to answer all of them at once. Just pick out one. Fantastic. Thank you very much, uh, Matthias. I think that let's then start with the clarification questions from, from for Ruth. The first one was, and we'll get also to the Palestinian uh, question. So this question about was the rollout linear or did you also have struggles that need to be fixed along the way? I think that is the, the key here. So the rollout um, started uh, very slow. People were quite uh, exigent and I think that um, the older people, uh, the first people who came were young people who were not uh, skeptical about the vaccine and the opportunity to get these leftovers uh, uh, was the, the, what uh, offered them the, the opportunity to come. And then older people also starting to see that uh, nothing happened, nothing very terrible happened to the younger people and they came. Um, I think that it has been more or less linear. I, uh, to be honest, I haven't uh, uh, followed day by day the rollout, but what we do see now that is that uh, currently most of the vaccinations are second doses and much less first doses. It means that less new people are coming to get vaccinated. And it appears that uh, younger people are more hesitant or less uh, in a hurry to come and get the vaccine. And this is why I mentioned the topic of uh, compliance, because um, it's important for all of them to, to be vaccinated. Okay, but the supply was always there. There was enough to keep going. There were no Okay. No, well, no. at the beginning, there was some concern that it would not be enough for the second dose, but uh, uh, very soon this, the shipment arrived and it was never a real problem. Okay. And then we have the question about, is there now, I mean, I think I read something in the paper today, but you probably know better that there is now some research, real evidence coming out of Israel regarding the effectiveness of the Pfizer 
BioNTech yeah. vaccine, right? Is it already published that I think people were asking, not just press releases, but real evidence? Do we have that already? Yes, the health plans have been uh, conducting research with their own data, and each of them is uh, publishing their own papers in very high level journals. Um, we do know that the efficacy is very close to what Pfizer uh, published in the lab uh, and their experiment. Um, and I wanted to, to, to mention something very interesting about the side effects and how they're tracked. So people get vaccinated and just after they step out from the clinic, they receive um, an SMS with a link to a questionnaire sent from their health plan. And in this questionnaire, they get asked, uh, how are you feeling and what uh, side effects did you feel? And you have a list, a very long list of side potential side effects and uh, option for other stuff. And the health plans, they, get, they, they gather this information. Moreover, if someone feels really sick after the, the vaccination, they go to the health plan to get treatment, right? They go to see their GPs or the nurse. So the health plan has the whole information. What is very important to mention is that the health plans do not provide uh, the electronic medical record as is. It's anonymized, it's aggregated. So the privacy is kept. The question is to what extent uh, the, the level of aggregation is there and how, uh, uh, I don't know, how possible is to uh, identify people. So uh, I think that the health plans are now the big players and uh, the, um, all of them have their own research institute, their own res research capacities. So they're doing a lot of jobs. Okay, so maybe, maybe now you could comment on also the, the, the question about pa Palestine. Is there, it, does Israel have a responsibility there or are they doing, what's going um, on? So according to the Oslo agreements and to the international law, the organization that is responsible for the vaccination of the Palestinian is the Palestinian Authority. And they have been procuring uh, the vaccination by themselves and they have turned to the, to, for, to the um, manufacturers. And Israel has the responsibility to allow the access to the vaccines. And um, I've heard that uh, because, because Israel had a lot of supply and they received also Moderna supplies, they donated, they gave these uh, vaccines to Palestine. But this was uh, side, um, it was not like a major um, policy from Israel. Mm, okay, thank you, Ruth. Um, let's now go to the Netherlands and to the UK and maybe... Malalon, you can first answer the question about was it only a supply issue and, you know, is this, this question about fairness and prioritization, you already made very clear that was not just a supply issue in the Netherlands, right? No, it was also a preparation and uh, that, that, that people said that um, behind because we have a system of, uh, of vaccination that works well, the influenza vaccination, uh, and, and they didn't think of... Uh, and uh, things that could, uh, could be going different, uh, especially in the, the, the storage at the minus 80. It was not possible for uh, GPs to, to store uh, vaccinations at, uh, at minus 80. And when you have this fragmentation of, of uh, when you start with all the older, uh, elderly first, you just have uh, a little bit of vaccine necessary for this group for each GP. So there was uh, difficulty in, in, in uh, uh, distribution system. Will the Netherlands catch up, do you think? I mean, I saw that there was a little bit of a, uh, it's bending, the curve is bending a little bit. Is it now catching up with some of the front runners within the EU, which are basically having similar supplies? Um, we are a little bit uh, getting up now, but whether we will uh, uh, catch up, uh, I, I don't know. There okay. are still a lot of uh, unclarities about the uh, and they try to refine the uh, high risk groups uh, because of the uh, level of availability of the vaccines, uh, which contributes to the uh, uh, confusion about who has to be vaccinated first. And uh, well, it's, it's a very complicated, uh, if you see the, the route to, uh, route map, roadmap to vaccination, it's a lot of colors and a lot of people that are involved. There are GPs vaccinating, there are nursing home physicians vaccinating, there are, uh, uh, we call it uh, occupational uh, physicians that are vaccinating, uh, the people that are working at the uh, uh, care institutes. So there are a lot of people uh, involved. Mm -hmm. And well, 
Mm -hmm. That yeah, the, the, the fragmentation issue that also John really clearly flagged up. Uh, Billy, maybe a very, very quick comment before we go back to Matthias again, because there seems to be 15 more questions. You'd already talked a bit, quite a bit about fairness, but maybe, maybe your thought. Yeah, yeah uh, well, uh, on the supply point, um, supply is the biggest constraint for us so far. Um, and you can see that from looking at daily vaccination rates. And clearly, we can up our rates on certain days. We can administer more. At some point, it will become a question of demand. So far, the the expected levels of vaccine hesitancy has been well. The reality has been less than they thought. So, when the older age groups, they were uh, considering maybe seventy five percent uptake. They've been getting about ninety percent. The one area they've been seemingly surprised about is in the social care and healthcare workers. Um, on, on the first come, first serve and the fairness bit, I mean, because it's a, overall a good news story, I think that's being overlooked at the moment. And I th think people are just glad that, you know, the vaccine's going into people's arms. It will increasingly become an issue. First and foremost, when some data comes out to actually see who's been getting it and is there a, uh, a sort of social demographic gradient about that. Thanks. Uh, Matthias, really quick for one final round of questions or maybe some that we can just select and pick, maybe then John also can. I think the fairness question is a good candidate because the fairness question is also pointing into the future. Sarada was saying that, I mean, you have at, in Israel a great vaccine rollout, rollout at the same time you have lockdown and you're discussing actually already certificates for freely travel around the, the, the world, you know, and that's another issue of, of fairness, you know, not only whether the leftovers are given to others or think about our little poll, you know, which is slightly different from priorities uh, we have uh, seen in, in countries. So maybe we could have a quick round on the, on, the, on the fairness issue, both in terms of, you know, who's getting it first, who's getting the leftover, but also what do we do in the future with those who have been vaccinated and those who haven't vaccin been vaccinated. Okay, perhaps John, you can take that question and you discuss it for the whole of Europe then. Oh yeah, thanks. Happy to discuss it for the whole of Europe. Um, no, I think that this whole vaccine passport, we were talking before we started about, um, about if in the UK, if you gave uh, vaccine passports uh, for pubs, then uh, you'd have no problems getting people to probably uh, uh, take, the, take the vaccine. I mean, I, I think that's going to be challenging unless there is a coherent uh, body like the WHO that 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 comes up with. You know, when you look at yellow fever vaccinations; these are these are are universal, and it doesn't seem like there is much of an appetite at this stage for for universal vaccine passports and and all of the inequities that come along with them. Uh, so I think while you know, obviously, countries may make uh, bilateral agreements with each other that allow some sort of vaccine passports. Um, I think on a on a larger scale, that it sounds very challenging, and it also seems like something that would, would, would be probably the, uh, resented by by a lot of people. I'm not so sure that it would it would necessarily improve uptake. There was a, a story recently, actually, about uh, some people trying to cross a border with uh, fake PCR tests. I believe uh, the Greek border. Uh, so I, I would imagine that you would run into problems like this as well, with uh, unless unless there was a single a single entity that was creating vaccine passports. Has this been discussed in the Netherlands, Madelon? Uh, yes, for sure. And uh, it's a very sensitive issue uh, because uh, in the Netherlands, we believe that you cannot uh, make uh, vaccines compulsory. And if you uh, give people more uh, better access to, to activities because of a vaccine passport, it's a, a kind of a hidden way of, uh, of uh, forcing people to, uh, to vaccinate. So uh, at the moment, there is uh, no plan uh, to, to, uh, to uh, install uh, one, uh, one thing like this. And uh, I don't know how it will develop in the future, but uh, I don't think the Netherlands is very eager to, uh, to do this. Yeah, was it the same in the UK, Billy? Yeah, I was going to say, there's, there's something, there's a slight nuance here about what we mean by a vaccine pass. But from my understanding, most of the proposals, it's not, spe it's not exclusively about whether you've had a vaccine. You can, for example, have had uh, a recent test to, to show that you aren't mm -hmm. young with COVID. And that's very important because for some people, they have contraindications, which means they can't have the vaccine. So that, that you know, adds a level of, uh, of sort of ethical issue around having a vaccine pass. It is being discussed very, uh, <laughs> it's very current discussion um, and many different opinions uh, on that in terms of not only you know, particularly about what it would cover, you know, whether it's about being able to go to certain events in certain locations or whether it's uh, traveling abroad. 
Thank you very much, Billy. So let's now wrap up um, and what we always do. We go to the keynote speaker who gives us her takeaway message from today's session before I close the whole session. So Ruth, what is your yes. takeaway after all this and the discussion? Um, so I think that we have to look at the case of Israel um, because Europe will be there in a couple of months in terms of uh, availability of the vaccines. And um, what I think is that we have to balance between priorities. And uh, for now, the vaccination was an emergency, uh, the only way that Israel could exit this lockdown and everything was done very fast and uh, in a very uh, prompt way. But we have to think on the long term how sustainable this is and how this rollout can be um, um, adapted to the whole healthcare system without undermining other very important primary care services that are provided by nurses and uh, how to ensure that people keep coming and getting the vaccine and um, Yes, the, the vaccination passport is a very complicated issue. In Israel now, people don't have to quarantine if they have this uh, vaccine certificate, um, but it has a lot of ethical implications for other um, limitations or, or delimitations, let's say. Um, and I think that also we have to think about privacy and the electronic medical record. It's a big benefit for uh, patients and for the continuity of care in Israel because uh, all the providers have access to the electronic medical records. So it's very good for continuity of care and patient-centered care, and it empowers the patient, but it has the downside of being somewhat prompt for leakages and uh, some problems of uh, data protection. So it has to be balanced as well. Okay, thank you very much, Ruth. Um, um, well, thank you for the keynote speak, uh, speech, obviously, and also the other speakers for their great uh, presentations today. Um, next week, we will be back in the same slot, and we will have another one on the vaccine rollout, more focused, I think, on keeping track and the data, I believe. And then we will have others uh, in the weeks ahead as well on long COVID and public-private partnerships. Um, information will appear soon on our website, so keep your uh, an eye out for that. Um, after we close, you will get prompted to fill out a evaluation. Uh, it helps us enormously if you do. So please stick around a little bit, fill it out, and we can improve our uh, seminars uh, or webinars even more. And uh, you know, have the relevant topics that you would like to hear about, which I'm sure there will be plenty. So. The final thing to say is just thank you very much and hope to see you next week. And in the meantime, uh, stay healthy. I'll see you then. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.